The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everybody. This is the ICE webinar for today, welcoming the IEA SSC Solar Academy. Please hold the line while we wait for more attendees to join. Welcome everybody, this is the ISIS webinar for today, welcoming the IEA SAC Solar Academy. Please hold the line while we wait for more attendees to join our call. All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar hosted by the International Solar Energy Society ISIS and by the IEA HSC Solar Academy. We are very pleased to have all of you here and we are especially happy to welcome back the IEA HSC Solar Academy for 2020. This is the first Solar Academy webinar ISIS is hosting this year and we are looking forward to many more exciting webinars to come. Today's webinar will introduce us to renovating historic buildings towards zero energy, and the webinar will last one and a half hours and will of course include a Q&A section for you, the audience. My name is Arabella and I am the Communications and Outreach Officer here at the ICE HQ in Freiburg, Germany, and I will give you a short introduction into ICES and the work we do, as we have many new participants joining us on the webinar today. The International Solar Energy Society ISIS is a non-profit UN accredited membership NGO. Our vision is 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students, businesses and advocates. ISIS works together with like-minded organizations from countries all around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. There are many ben benefits to joining ISIS and you can find out more on our homepage. Some of the benefits are the exclusive access to presentations and webinar recordings such as today's in the ISIS webinar archive. ISIS members can also get discounts and even free registration to ISIS events and partner events. Every month, ISIS publishes a newsletter for our members where you can follow our progress and share your news. Members can also subscribe to our academic journal Solar Energy at a reduced price. So we welcome those who are not yet members to join today to support our work. For those who are already a member, we thank you for your support. Now for some brief information on the webinar and especially the Q&A section before we start. During today's webinar, our expert speakers will give their presentation on renovating historic buildings towards zero energy. This will be followed by a Q&A section for you, the audience. For the Q&A section, we invite you to send in your questions and we are looking forward to your participation. When sending in the questions, please write who the question is for and keep your question short and precise. Please feel free to start sending in your questions at any time throughout the webinar. Additionally, today's webinar will feature a series of mini videos. Should you experience any technical difficulties in seeing the videos, please do stay online. This usually only lasts for a few seconds. Now, I'm happy to introduce our moderator for today, Babel App. Babel will introduce you to our speakers and guide us through the Q&A session. Babel is the founder and managing director of the agency Solrico, Solar Market Research and International Communication, a network for solar thermal professionals worldwide. She is responsible for the international newsletter at solarthermalworld.org, which has been de dedicated exclusively to the solar heating and cooling sector. Babel graduated in physics and looks back at more than 20 years of journalism in the field of solar thermal energy. Now, I'm happy to hand over to you, Babel. Babel, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Arabella. 
Thanks for the nice introduction and also a nice welcome from my side to all of you. I'm the moderator as of the webinar today and I will give you a short introduction into ISA, IASHC, uh, which is one of the co-organizers of this webinar. So I hope that you see my screens now. Well, the IA Solar Heating and Cooling Program was um, is one of uh, several uh, technology collaboration programs under the International Energy Agency. It's actually one of the oldest ones since 1977. We have uh, 20 member countries and the European Commission as well as four international organizations which support the work. More than 400 experts from all five continents group together in research platforms and they cover a big range of topics. I have listed here some of them. PV thermal is a current topic, district heating, industrial solar heat, industrial water management, facade integration, neighborhood planning and compact heat storages and as well historic buildings as we hear today. You're very welcome to look into the webinars which we have done over the years with ISIS and you find them all in their recording and the presentations on this uh, sub page, Solar Academy webinars. You can also watch videos. We have done regular videos with experts on our conferences which you find on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can uh, ask for on-site trainings um, by our program, which is uh, possible in IA member countries. And the past trainings were in China, South Africa and UK. Where you can find more information, certainly on our website, iashc.org. If you have particular questions, you can contact the Secretariat. You can follow us on social media. The Twitter channel is IASHC or LinkedIn, we have a group which is called IA Solar Heating and Cooling Program and under YouTube. Today's webinar's title, as Arabella already told us, is Renovating Historic Buildings Towards Zero Energy. This is also the name of a working group within the IA, which has a number and we consider it or we call it as short term Task 59. So we will talk today always about the research program Task 59. And I have the pleasure to introduce you to all the speakers of today's uh, webinar. Um, usually we interrupt uh, between the speeches, but today we have a very special setting and you will have, like Arabella said, a multimedia mix of films where end consumers um, will talk or give their point of view on the renovated houses and you will hear some input by the experts to respond to the tasks. And so this will be like a, a continuous presentation and um, Alexandra Troy, she will guide us through the webinar and um, which is partly mixed with films and slides. Alexandra is actually the chair of this what we call Task 59 and she's co-founder and vice head of OIREC Institute of Renewable Energy in Italy. Her main field of research are historic buildings and cultural heritage, so a real expert in this field. The second speaker is Walter Hüttler. He will inspire us through successful case studies. And this is also the task of his subgroup within task 59. They are responsible for collecting best practice cases of renovated historic buildings. He is managing partner at E7 Energy Innovation and Engineering in Vienna, Austria. And beforehand, he was working with the Austrian Energy Agency and he was also a research fellow at the Vienna University. The third, Thor Burström, will introduce a systematic approach for decision making and planning of renovation projects. Tor leads within task 59, the group which is called multidisciplinary planning process. He is professor for building um, conservation, building conservation at Uppsala University in Sweden. And he's also coordinator of the Swedish research program on energy efficiency in historic buildings. Fourth, we will have Pavel Sevela. He represents a tool that supports the retrofitting process of historic buildings. Pavel chairs the group within the task 59 that identifies replicable retrofit solutions from case studies. 
He is project engineer at the Leopold Franzens University in Innsbruck, Austria since 2013, but he was also working as a standalone building designer in his earlier career. So the last one, Daniel Herrera is actually a close colleague of Alexandra. He will discuss the different steps within renovating of a rural historic building. He is part of the organizing team of Task 59 and senior researcher at OIREC in Italy since May 2017. His focus is on the development and validation of new retrofit solutions. Originally, he's from Spain and he was trained as an architect. So you see, we have a very dedicated group of experts on historic buildings, and I'm really looking forward to this interesting presentation. And I will hand now the floor over to Alexandra Troy, who will lead us as a narr narrator through the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elbel, for the nice introduction. And welcome also from my side. <clears throat> The goal of this webinar is, as Babel said, to present the IEA SHC Task 59 and to show in a clear and a compre compre comprehensive way to stakeholders how they can profit from the work carried out in the research project. The building owners and the design team have always been central in our project and that is why we wanted them to be part of this webinar too which means that the needs and the concerns of those who have to take the decisions in the renovation process of historic buildings are here presented by real owners and architects that have worked on several projects of building retrofit in South Tyrol in Italy. Let's start listening to them and explaining why they decided to renovate their buildings. Mir und mir entschlossen, den Hulberhof zu renovieren, weil es auch so verletzt war. Ich bin nie der Einzige, der sich mit der Frieda zusammen gewöhnt bin. Ich bin nie bis jetzt nie gewöhnt bei ihr, aber dann haben wir gesagt, wir gehen aus und dort in die Jungen, die ich übernehme. Und dann riecht man so etwas. Dann hat die Insider gemeint, da hat auch viel, viel mitgeholfen, schaut, was man da auf, was das so wird, wie es alles bis jetzt ist. Dann ist dann wieder mal gut, noch zu bauen. Nein. seit ca. fünf Generationen da und es sind etwas über 100 Jahre und wir fühlen uns eigentlich ziemlich wohl seit der Zeit da. Und heint wir leben da ca. drei, also leben dort drei Generationen, das sind zum einen meine Eltern, dann ich mit meiner Schwester und noch Schwester mit der Freundin und dann noch die zwei Kinder von der Schwester. Vorne und bauen wir überhaupt, als wir beheizte Räume gehabt und sehr ist auch mit Winterszeit, weil wir recht einen Monat kurz und haben, ist schon öfter mal ziemlich kalt her. Nach dem Umbau für uns geändert hat sich, dass das Haus jetzt äh, innen überall warm ist, nachdem dass es gut isoliert ist und eine Zentralheizung hat. Früher war die Stube beheizbar und die, der Herd in der Küche. Und wenn es ganz kalt ist gewesen, musste man in drei, haben wir in drei Orten Feuer machen. Und das braucht es jetzt nicht mehr, ist eine wesentliche Sicherheit auf dem Brandschutz.
Wenn ihn der Architekt das erste Projekt gezogen hat für ein Haus, war das für uns ganz toll. Die Vorfreude ist noch gleich schon gestartet. Für mich persönlich war es äh, fein oder halt schon der Gedanke daran, dass wir, ich und der Matthias äh, separat auf einer Stockwohnung kennen, war für mich ganz wichtig, weil wir zuerst alle auf einen Stock miteinander gelebt haben. Wir haben uns entschlossen, das Haus zu sanieren. Aber die Überlegung ist noch gewesen, dann eben da ein Seil zu stellen. Aber weil das Haus unter Denkmalschutz steht, nachher ist die Überlegung gewesen, die Erweiterung ist schwierig, weil. Und dann sind wir da auf die Idee gekommen, dann eben dann selbst zu stellen. Aber das ist gleich wieder vollgeladen worden, weil die Wurstel in den Alm in den Haus äh, äh, gewesen ist. Und wir sind da auch, oder ich bin da auch gewachsen und äh, ich will, de, will das äh, in meiner, meiner Kinder wieder weitergeben. Für mich ist ein Hof äh, ein, wichtiges, ein wichtiges Instrument äh, im Dorf für die Wirtschaft, für, äh, für das ganze Zusammenleben auch mit den anderen Leuten und äh, für uns selber, dass man einfach davon leben kann und dass auch mehrere Leute davon leben können. Ein Südtirol ohne Bauernhöfe, ohne historische Strukturen, gar nicht für mich nicht vorstellbar. Und als Planer, wenn ich auf dem Meierhof aufmerksam geworden bin oder wenn ich gefragt worden bin, den Meierhof zu sanieren. Der Meierhof ist ein ganz besonderer Bauernhof. Er, ist, er steht nicht auf einem Alm, er steht nicht auf dem Berg, er steht am Anfang, am Dorfeingang äh, von Bad Schings. Er hat Zinnen, es ist ein herrschaftlicher Bauernhof, eine besondere Herausforderung deswegen. Und es ist extrem wichtig, wenn Bauern solche Ansätze besitzen, sie, dass sie die nicht als ein, eine Last empfinden, sondern als ein, ein Juwel, das man herausputzen kann und an dem es richtig Es ist ein Alleinstellungsmerkmal. So einen Bauernhof zu besitzen, das Glück muss man erst haben. Actually, you have heard that the reasons to <coughs> retrofit the building are manifold, that often owners are aware of the importance of uh, their historic buildings and want to improve the living conditions as, as the best way to maintain them. However, they might not imagine that it is actually possible. Um, the interviews here were asked afterwards and still in some cases you could hear their initial doubt, will it be possible? I'd therefore like to invite Walter Hüttler from E7 in Vienna, Austria, who leads within Task 59 the topic of creating a solid knowledge base and to introduce you the Hyper Atlas, a collection of best practice cases. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Alexandra. Hello and good afternoon. Um, we, we have now already seen we have seen uh, a couple of, of cases, of different cases from the rural area with different starting points. And it's my pleasure now to guide you through uh, the best practice database we already developed because it's one of our specific goals in our project to identify good practice examples of historic building renovations and make them available to other interested groups and so to say provide a, a source of inspiration for our target groups. So um, who are our target groups? We are addressing quite different stakeholders uh, with maybe different interests and different understanding of the complexity of a renovation process. Um, Specifically, of course, building owners, but also architects, planners, engineers, and of course, uh, public administration and people from the heritage uh, community. So, um, speaking 
um, about historic buildings. What do we mean? We orientate ourselves by the European standard 16883, which basically includes all buildings with elements worthy of preservation for architectural reasons or cultural or heritage reason, reasons, which means uh, basically we include uh, buildings on all types um, of different uses from all ages, whether they are listed or somehow protected or not. So what you can see here is um, a kind of timeline of selected case studies we've already uh, included in our database. On the left side, you can see um, farmhouse, farmhouses from South Tyrol, which were built already before 1600. But you also uh, would find um, churches, uh, Mercado, but also small or large residential buildings, for example, those cases from Vienna, from typical Gründerzeit buildings, but on the right top, uh, bottom, you, you find um, this office building, uh, which was built in the 1950s and which uh, was renovated and is now used as a, a community and cultural uh, service <clears throat> building, sorry. So um, what you can see here is the beta version of the Hyper Atlas, which means that the database, this platform is still work in progress. We have now a number of about 15 projects online in this beta version, but the, the process is now accelerating. We expect to have about 50 case studies before the summer and about 100 case studies by the end of the year. If I say we, I mean uh, all colleagues from our IEA Task 59, but also the colleagues from the Atlas pro project, and particularly, of course, the team from Europe, with special thanks to Daniel Herrera, who is also with us in the webinar today. He's coordinating not only the review process, but also the technical development of this platform, and also the link to Team Blau, who are the web developers in Italy. So uh, let's step into, I would like to uh, talk you through a little bit um, through the different levels of uh, information we provide in this platform. On the first level of information, you uh, would see all the, the, the contact details, a short summary of each of the case study. You would find images and plans, of course, and if you go um, a little bit uh, deeper, hopefully well-balanced pictures, drawings, text, uh, also on the renovation process, but also on the technical interventions, walls, windows, HVAC, but also renewable energy systems. And finally, the evaluation part on the energy efficiency costs and uh, indoor uh, climate, uh, for example. Uh, this is uh, an example uh, from Vienna. Um, if we here go a little bit deeper, uh, you would find more specific uh, information on this um, key information, building age, building use, technical data on the building, but uh, you can also step into more detailed innovation, uh, information on the renovation process from this point or on specific information on the retrofit solutions, for example. So um, if you go down here, you would find a verbal description of uh, retrofit solutions, for example, for the wall, um, but also reasons why specific uh, interventions, interventions uh, were chosen. Uh, you find U values, for example, before and after the intervention, but you can get, uh, go one step deeper. And there you would find, for example, uh, specific information, schematic drawings on the original wall buildup, but also the retrofitted uh, situation. Uh, as you know, there are 
you will find uh, the situation that you have not only one type of wall in a building, particularly in historical buildings, you may find different types of walls. So there's also the possibility to find different solutions for different types of walls for um, a specific case study. And also the verbal description. And then finally, what is uh, very important from our point of view, the evaluation part, uh, where you find uh, information on the energy efficiency, for example, actual data on the consumption, energy consumption um, for heating, for example, but also data on not only the investment costs, but also, if available, also the running costs and data on indoor climate. Um, if there are no measured parameters, for example, for this case study. There is also the possibility to give a verbal description for, uh, for example, the feedback from the users uh, on indoor air quality or acoustic comfort. But as you can see here, um, if there is uh, such a document available, uh, we provide, for example, a post-occupancy evaluation as for a download from this platform. So this is uh, basically the, the content uh, on the different levels you would find. As you can see on this um, logos, from this is a combined effort from uh, both the Interreg Alpine Space project, uh, which involves nine partners from six countries, and the already mentioned Task 59 from the IEA SHC uh, program, which involves 24 partners from 12 countries. And as I've said, we are aiming at uh, about or more than 100 projects. Uh, we are happy um, to have uh, established already the connection to other platform, for example, to Construction 21. And we are also looking forward to uh, connections, for example, to national platforms, uh, as for example, Stadt der Zukunft in Austria, but we know there are other possibilities possibilities to establish uh, such platforms. So uh, finally, I would uh, really invite you, um, if you somehow are involved uh, as an architect, as a planner in um, a renovation of a historic building, which could serve as a case study, please get in touch with us. Uh, you might ask, um, are there specific criteria for such a, a case study? Um, Yes, it should be a renovation of the whole building. There should be a significant reduction of energy consumption. So um, as you can see, there is no uh, specific value, but it should be in any case better than business as usual. The project should be implemented and of course, heritage value assessed and respected. And the most difficult part, the documentation of um, a tech, uh, technical solutions should be available. And if possible, also monitoring data on energy consumption and cost. So please get in touch. Uh, here are our coordinates and the uh, email addresses. Thank you for the moment. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Walter, for this introduction. Um, if now browsing through the Hyber Atlas, seeing the images, experiences of uh, which others have made convinced you, if you want to renovate your building, um, the next question which arises is how to begin with this? Uh, let's again listen to the South Tyrolean building owners and architects. Bei der Planungsphase hat man noch auch gesehen, das Haus voller Gras ist und eine riesige Kubik durch und für ihn zu einfach zu groß. Und somit haben wir uns eigentlich entschlossen, äh, Ferienwohnungen auch zu machen auf dem Hof, äh, zudem die hofeigenen Produkte für die Gäste anzubieten und dass die Gäste auch sehen, was in unserem Hof alles drinsteckt, die Natur, äh, die Landwirtschaft, alles mit zu erleben. 
Und für mich auch, ähm, hat es sich so auch ergeben, dass ich daheim bleiben kann, dass ich die Ferienwohnungen betreuen kann, mit den Gästen das machen kann und der Mann auf dem Feld arbeiten kann. Aber auch bei der Gemeinschaft, beide zusammen, die Gäste nachher bei den Hofführungen alles zeigen können. Wir und wir entschlossen, zu renovieren, bei den Neubau zu machen. Wenn man das wie eine riesige Gemeinde gezogen hat, ist mir es wert, dass ich wunderschön ja ist und bin es gefallen. Wohl viel gesagt, und ich schade mit ihren alten Tempel beim Haufen schupfen und alles weg, das soll sie nicht aus, aber es ist mir im Moment auch Freude mit alles und es ist schön geworden. Als mich das erste Mal kontaktiert hat bezüglich dem Umbau, hat er eigentlich schon ganz klare Vorstellungen gehabt. Normalerweise ist ja die, die Aufgabe oder die Herausforderung, dass man praktisch die ganzen Wünsche, die Vorstellungen und die Visionen von Bau her umsetzt. Am Anfang, wenn man an ein denkmalgeschütztes Gebäude herangeht, denkt man sich ja, man kann gar nicht energetisch sanieren, weil man den Eindruck hat, es ist alles geschützt. Ich muss sagen, in unserem Fall war es so, dass wir es eigentlich sehr gut geschafft haben, zusammen mit dem Denkmalamt und auch mit der Klimahausagentur einen guten Weg zu finden, dieses Gebäude energetisch zu sanieren. Es war ein großer Wunsch von den Bauherren, den Komfort dieses Gebäudes zu verbessern. Uns ist es, glaube ich, sehr gut gelungen, mit dem Einbauen von Innendämmung, neuer Fenster, sogar der kontrollierten Lüftung, einer Stückholzheizung, die Integration in Absprache mit dem Denkmal von Photovoltaik und Solarthermie. Also wir haben wirklich das ganze Programm geschafft und haben es wirklich geschafft, ein für die Wünsche und Ansprüche der Bauherren. Der Meierhof ist ein Gebäude, das eine sehr starke Persönlichkeit hat. Und also war es uns in der Planung wichtig, das Gebäude zu verstehen und es ist überhaupt nicht wichtig gewesen, als Architekt ein Zeichen zu setzen. Es war eigentlich mein Wunsch bei der Planung, das Gebäude wieder aufleben zu lassen und das Gebäude als solches freizuspielen. The role of the architect is clearly very important in the renovation project. However, These are very complicated projects, um, usually quite more complicated with more variables than a normal project. How can the architect and the owner be sure that they have considered all measures and evaluated them appropriately? <clears throat> uh, Tor Brostrom from Uppsala University in Sweden looks within task 59 specifically at this question on how to organize the multidisciplinary planning project and we'll explain now how the EN standard 16883 can lead you through the process. Tor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, hello and uh, good afternoon to all the uh, uh, webinar participants. Um, The title of my uh, presentation is a systematic approach for decision making and planning. And um, uh, the picture you see on the right um, is from my hometown. Uh, it shows the uh, uh, range of, of buildings we're talking about from the uh, medieval monumental to the uh, more uh, ordinary buildings of the uh, uh, 20th century. Even though I'm a professor in building conservation, uh, my background is in engineering. Um, and um, uh, my first job out of university, I was an energy auditor. And, and uh, I found that there was a lot of confusion 
uh, and misunderstandings when it came to energy renovation of existing buildings. Uh, and as Alexander indicated, uh, the situation becomes even more complex and, and possibly confusing when uh, we're talking about historic buildings. Uh, there are many laws and regulations. Uh, there are expectations, uh, implicit and, and uh, explicit, uh, many different actors, uh, different competencies that are needed. Our solution um, to, to deal with this um, uh, is to uh, propose a, a more systematic uh, decision process. Um, a systematic approach, step by step, uh, built on uh, trans transdisciplinary collaboration from the beginning. Uh, and this is based on uh, a European guideline for improving the energy performance of historic buildings, EN 16883, uh, which was finished in 2017. The guidelines aim to um, uh, facilitate uh, the improvement of energy performance of historic buildings while respecting their heritage significance. Uh, this deals with, uh, as, as Walter indicated before, historically, uh, architecturally or culturally valuable buildings. So it's not limited to listed or, or otherwise formally protected buildings. It applies to historic buildings of all types and ages. A working pr it presents a working procedure which is based on uh, simple steps, investigation, analysis and documentation of the building including its heritage significance. Now this is the Solar Academy and some of you may think where does solar energy come into play? Well the standard deals with uh, improvements and, and, and energy renovation uh, applying both to the demand and supply side uh, on the left, you see a building uh, that will be uh, uh, externally insulated, uh, where the uh, uh, building envelope will be made more airtight and, and, and windows will be uh, improved, uh, all in a way to respect its, its original uh, significance. On the left, you see, and this is only a photoshopped picture, uh, what it could look like if you put solar panels uh, on, on the roof of a, of a historic building. Um, and, and the latter, of course, is something where there are very different opinions uh, and, and therefore it's especially needed uh, to take it on with a systematic approach. The um, uh, standard or the guidelines is really um, uh, presents a procedure uh, to facilitate the best decision in each individual case, uh, rather than trying to, to point at good or bad solutions in general, because as we all know, historic buildings as well as buildings in general, we present a wide range of, of uses, construction types, uh, so it's difficult not to, difficult not to say impossible uh, to point at, at uh, universally applicable solutions, but we rather point at a way to reach a good solution in each case. Um, it includes a step-by-step -step process uh, with some iterations. Uh, each of the steps are described uh, more, uh, more in detail in the standard, and here uh, I will only give you a brief overview of each step. Initiating the planning process uh, includes information of things that you need to consider before you get started. Uh, building survey and asset assessment, of course, is important to understand what is the present status of the building uh, in terms of construction, indoor climate, energy performance, uh, what is the present use, what, what is the um, foreseen changes in terms of use. Specifying objectives and, and usually renovation projects are driven by um, specific or, or explicit objectives in terms of energy performance, but it's also important in order to balance this to specify objectives in terms of conservation and preservation. Uh, the next step 
would be to decide by, by comparing the present state of the building in relation to the objectives, we decide if an improvement is needed or not. Uh, and then we go on uh, with a procedure to find a package of, of measures uh, that are appropriate for this building. Uh, and this starts with a long list of possible measures. And uh, such a list depends on the regional context, uh, traditions, uh, technology, know-how available. Uh, and based on that, uh, we suggest that a transdisciplinary group of professionals taking into account technical aspects as well as conservation, um, exclude inappropriate measures that, that clearly are inappropriate for the building in question. Uh, after that, uh, we propose to make uh, a detailed, in-depth uh, assessment of remaining measures with respect to um, economy, uh, energy performance, indoor climate, uh, impact on the building, physical as well as on aesthetic and heritage values. Uh, and that results in, in um, a few selected uh, measures uh, in order priority. And, and then we group them together in packages. Uh, and the final step is to see uh, if the proposed package uh, uh, allows us to fulfill or reach the objectives that we set out from the beginning. For those of you who uh, uh, work professionally in the field, uh, I would assume or hope that this is nothing new, but rather something that you recognize. Uh, for those of you who may be private homeowners, this may be completely new. Uh, so this means that the uh, standard can be used or the guideline can be used in in several ways. Uh, you can use it for quality assurance and then follow it strictly. Suppose the authorities in a country or a region uh, want to, to uh, ascertain that uh, when we work with uh, historical buildings of, of a certain value category that, that uh, we, we, we follow um, a certain procedure. Um, it can be used as an inspiration to modify existing procedures. Um, I think that most professionals working in the field, one way or another, already have uh, a working procedure. Uh, and finally, it can be used as a simple checklist as a whole or in parts. So questions to the audience. Um, uh, is if the standard is known, uh, is the standard being used? Uh, we're trying to find projects, uh, professionals uh, who have used the standard and, and we want to find out how does it work in practice. Within Task 59, we're working to um, facilitate an extended use of, this, of the standard uh, by enhancing it and providing additional information in terms of tools and guidelines, the need for training. Uh, and we also have uh, another uh, tools in our toolbox, uh, Walter already in introduced uh, the best practice database. And we also have uh, a database for, for uh, single solutions that are suitable for different types of historic buildings. So in summary, uh, my objective with the presentation was to um, let you know that there is uh, a standard. There are also uh, uh, other uh, guidelines that, that, that can be used. Um, and uh, we're always looking for more case studies. So if uh, anybody is interested to use the standard or already has done it, uh, so please feel free to contact me. And also, of course, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tor. <clears throat> now, after that look to the um, decision process, let's go back to the building owners and architects in South Tyrol and see what solution to improve the energy efficiency uh, they have chosen.
unser Anliegen war jetzt die energetische Sanierung des Hauses, weil ansonsten natürlich kein angenehmes Leben in so einem alten Haus möglich wäre. Wir haben also versucht, das Haus von innen zu isolieren mit 4 cm Dämmung und dann haben wir noch eine Wandheizung realisiert, die zum einen die Wärme an den Raum abgibt und zum anderen die Wände austrocknet. Unsere Überlegungen für die energetische Sanierung von dem Haus waren herauszufinden, welche Bauteile man möglichst einfach dämmen kann, ohne die historische Bausubstanz zu beeinträchtigen. Deswegen haben wir unser Hauptaugenmerk eben auf die Dämmung von den Fußböden und Decken zu den kalten Räumen und das Dach gelegt. Zusätzlich haben wir natürlich die Fenster getauscht. Als Heizsystem wurde die Geothermie gewählt, weil die mit auf möglichst kleinem Raum man da die Heizung installieren kann und der unabhängig funktioniert zu relativ geringen Kosten. Wir haben saniert und haben zugleich ein modernes Wohnen möglich machen müssen. Und da haben wir einfach äh, Gebäudeteile, die der Sonne zugewandt sind, aufgemacht sodass äh, die Sonne das Haus durchfluten kann und andere äh, in Ruhe gelassen. Nur durch äh, Fensteraustausch, energieersparende Maßnahmen, Dämmungen und ja, eigentlich nichts. Dämmungen versucht ein modernes, äh, ein Wohlfühlen im Gebäude zu ermöglichen. figlio del proprietario è il maestro carpentiere. Con lui abbiamo cercato di realizzare il più possibile eh, la costruzione eh, tipica in legno della Val d'Ultimo. Eh, usando loro legname, eh, loro maestranze e eh, naturalmente le parti in pietra, le parti mattoni o le parti tecniche sono state eseguite con le tecniche moderne che noi conosciamo oggi. Il problema fondamentale era creare questo impianto di riscaldamento, questa centrale termica, questo vano e eh, diciamo c'erano due opzioni, o intervenire in uno dei locali della cantina, quindi rovinando completamente quello che era eh, l'aspetto originale delle cantine, oppure diciamo creare un vano interrato esterno per non disturbare tutto quanto tutto l'impianto della cantina. And I close the video just to remind the audience that you can already now type in your questions in the chat fun, uh, field. They will be collected by our moderator, grouped and asked other, uh, afterwards to the single contributors. Um, there are many solutions out there, as you have seen from these examples. The key is knowing which of these are relevant. Um, and also when a solution is safe and when it is compatible with the conservation of that specific building. University of Innsbruck in Austria is leading within task 59, this collection and finding of conservation compatible solutions. I'd invite now Pavel Sevela to introduce you to the decision guidance tool. Pavel, floor is yours. Um, good afternoon also from my side. Um, just a quick check. I hope you uh, see my uh, screen. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, welcome again and I'm happy to present you uh, the slides uh, I prepared together with my colleague Eleanor Leonardi and give you a brief uh, status update on the intermediate work uh, towards the... sorry Yes, uh, that was the best uh, practice database and decision guidance tool to uh, exemplary energy efficient interventions in historical buildings. Dear Pavel, uh, could you please show us your other screen? Thank you. Oh, yes. I thought that will happen. 
Okay, so let's hopefully it's fine now. All right. Um, so we see the same thing now. So, um, and as every presentation, I start with a story. Uh, so once upon a time, uh, there was an uh, architect, Franz Baumann. Uh, he was built, uh, he was born in um, Innsbruck um, in uh, uh, 1892. And he was a very famous architect for his uh, so-called uh, classic master. Um, and what between uh, one of his master uh, pieces um, belongs this NMS uh, heading school uh, in Innsbruck. Uh, he was, he built this building in 1930. In a, in a part of the city called Hetting, and here you see the building. It was very particular for 1930 because it looked very modern back then. Uh, it imitated a flat roof, so it had a very low slope, and it looked like a modern building nowadays. You can see it uh, because the difference to the other farmhouses is, uh, is so significant. Um, it's over here. And you can imagine that it was quite a challenge when we have been told uh, that we're supposed to bring a photovoltaic system on this building. Um, so, and we were thinking that if we could succeed uh, and um, agree with the heritage office to be able to install a PV system on such a building, it could pave the way to other uh, example buildings in the region that could uh, follow and maybe uh, use the same uh, way in order to um, extend the uh, power needed uh, by the PV system in times like these where we have to uh, find solution to the climate change and we need every square meter uh, possible. And as we know in Europe, there is a very uh, big share of uh, cities with the historical old towns. And you know what? We uh, succeeded. And that's why we've been thinking that this would be a good uh, story to start with. So the Heritage Office actually had just two conditions we had to fulfill and to be able to answer them. So it was not uh, impossible. And in the end, it was quite easy. So the first condition was that uh, it can be per uh, permanently installed. So we uh, decided for this uh, clamps uh, to install the PV system. So it's basically a temporary installation uh, is a five kilowatt peak and could be always uh, extended. The second uh, was a visual uh, condition that this system should not be uh, visible from the street or for the pedestrians. So uh, we um, uh, figure out that uh, you would be able to see the PV system if you are 65 square uh, meters far from the building, from the facade. Uh, which on the street uh, uh, is not uh, possible because the buildings are uh, much closer to each other. And from the yard, um, you would need 65 meters, but that's so far away that you are not able to distinguish between the surface of a PV system and the roof having a similar uh, pattern. Um, and uh, after these discussions, it was possible to install the system and it really happened. So uh, that's why we decided also to create the decision, the decision guidance tool uh, to document such a good examples and many more that can uh, show others um, how to uh, follow um, such installations and don't start from the beginning and to, start to share these success stories. Um, so now I will like to show you the functionality of the tool. It's not the real website, but it's just a presentation where you can see uh, how the tool is supposed to work. To uh, be able to uh, cover all the uh, renovation measures, not just solar, but all of them, uh, we decided to uh, display uh, at the first cross section of a building where is everything uh, involved and everything visible. So the user uh, can, by clicking on the ele building element, uh, select or select from the menu on the left-hand side. In this case, we would start with the 
uh, solar energy uh, right down down uh, right down there like this and then the user will be asked uh, just several questions uh, the first one for example if you can uh, install your renewables on the roof as a first the most advantage uh, um, option if no the facade is offered and so on uh, and if there is really no other options to install the PV on your uh, building then at least uh, we would like to display uh, solutions where there is a freestanding um, uh, installation allowed or uh, participation models of renewables via power network. So if we would uh, use the same uh, mentality and we would like to um, find this example of uh, the school in Hetting, we would probably um, go like this. So renewables on the, on the roof, yes. Uh, but it should be roof non-integrated. Here we go. And then we click a preview. And then we're going to see all the details uh, about the installations and um, components, installation powers and drawings. So as I said, uh, this, is, this tool is not restricted only to renewables, but as you see to a building envelope, such as walls, windows, roof and so on, uh, but also building services as a heating, cooling, ventilation systems. So let's proceed with the example of our walls. So we click on wall. Um, because wall is such a particular solution, it makes sense uh, to, um, to pre-select certain types of buildings. Uh, you can click on the region where the building is in the map. Uh, or if you don't want to restrict uh, your search, you can just skip. And if, if you decide to use the map, you will be uh, offered a set of archetypes, uh, certain architectonical type of buildings. You select yours, and as before, you will be asked several set of questions, which will break down uh, the selection just to several. Uh, so you will be able to see and decide for general principles or particular examples of, in this case, uh, uh, wall insulation. Um, since the walls are very much in connection with the windows, for example, um, after uh, choosing your uh, detail, you will be directed also and offered also to see the uh, window details because this cross sections and details really matters while you plan your renovation. Uh, as you see here, um, each um, solution has a magnifier and a shopping bag. I will get back to it. We are not a profit-oriented uh, European project, no worry. Um, so the magnifier is you just uh, there to increase the size and be able to read uh, what is inside. And the shopping bag is basically just to save it into your uh, bag for a later printout. So if you click on the magnifier, you see the solution. And same like before, you can uh, get yourself more informed what is, uh, this solution is about. And if you would like to save it, you click on the shopping bag. Um, if this solution is a part of the building, which is uh, documented as a building, as a renovated building, so-called best practice, uh, that was the part uh, presented by Walter. You can also jump and see uh, the building renovation in the um, database itself. So, and when you are uh, done with uh, playing and searching in the tool, you can go uh, to this uh, shopping bag or shopping trolley where are all your saved uh, details and solutions and you can uh, click and export them uh, to a PDF once uh, you're finished. So let me conclude. Um, what is this tool about and uh, why it should matter to you? So it follows this mentality. Uh, we start with the problem. We uh, help you to define the, the renovation measure. Uh, in a visual way. Then, uh, by associating the archetypes, we guide you, the user to appropriate a renovation approach to find the exact solution you are searching and helping uh, you. And if documented, uh, we're going to demonstrate on a real case study uh, where the solution was implemented. So, the message is to inspire the user to renovate and not to rebuild, not to demolish, uh, but keep the old spirit and prevent the European heritage we, we have here uh, by demonstrating the real solutions.
So uh, as before, I just would like to show the website uh, and my contact, and I would like to give the word back to uh, uh, the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. Um, for the very end, to conclude with, I would ask my colleague Daniel Herrera to actually show you um, with taking the Rheinhof as an example, the whole process from the uh, def definition of the aim, the interaction with the conservation authorities to the solutions adopted. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Herrera and as Alexander already mentioned, I will guide you through the renovation of one particular case study. For that, I will be using the website of the Hyber Atlas, so the database of the energy retrofit of historic buildings, where this particular building has been already documented. The Rheinhof is a farmhouse built around the 16th century in Santa Maddalena, in the north part of Italy, in the middle of the Alps. As you can see in the, reno in the documentation of the project in the website, we already have all the information that characterize this uh, project uh, in the top menu. We can see that the final energy performance of this building after the renovation achieved uh, 60 kilowatt hour per square meter per year, although it is in a high altitude, it's around 1500 meters above sea level, so that should be considered when assessing the final energy performance of this building. The building it is listed, it is under heritage protection in the region of the province of Bolzano, or it's not part of a conservation area. It was built before 1600 and it has never been renovated before. Originally, it was used as a residential building in the rural setting, and now it's been changed to a holiday department. The square area, just briefly mentioned, that is around 400 square meters, is a detached house, and uh, is made of three floors with no basement, and a total uh, surface area or envelope area of more than 650 square meters. The building is built with a stone masonry wall on the ground floor and a block bow, so a solid wood construction in the upper floors. It is rendered externally and plastered on the inside, directly on the uh, structural system, and it has a pitch roof. If we jump to the renovation process, we get into the, the description of the building. So how the building before any intervention was, and that's the process that the architects followed together with the owners in understanding the particularities of this building. This is one of the most precious rural buildings of the area and it's just place of the main road in a prominent position. It is one of the first buildings you see when you came into this village. As I said, the ground floor was built with solid stone masonry walls, whereas the first and top presents many, uh, was built with a vernacular, block bow, solid wood construction, and the building presents many traditional features, such as windows with deep reveals that are highly decorated, and then vaulted ceilings around the entrance. Regarding the heritage significance of the building, the, the, the building is a Pahov, that is a traditional rural building where the two main functions of the building were separated. So there was one building that was accommodating the dwelling functions and the second building where all the rural, all the farming was uh, developed. The building was mainly, the main residential building was accommodating three different generations living under the same roof and it was mainly occupied in the living room and kitchen, the only two rooms that were actually heated. The three main facades of the building are under heritage protection and should be kept. The ground floor was that is built in stone masonry is still preserves or still conserves the traditional lime plaster and therefore any intervention to the outside had to be ruled out since the very beginning. The window and door openings in the ground floor have these deep rebuilds and are fully decorated around it. The entrance with the vaulted ceiling, also called as Labe in the region, it is a precious and very unique feature that should be also kept. The Stube, the main living room in the ground floor, it is decorated with wooden cladding and has all the sections uh, with high decorations. The negotiation of the, the heritage assessment or the heritage value of this building was always held in collaboration with the Heritage Authority of the province of Bolzano. At the very beginning of the project, a dialogue was set between the, all the parties involved, the property owners, the, the architects and designers of the building, and the heritage authority responsible for this area. After a first meeting, the architects involved in the project developed a proposal, and eight, meters, eight months later, the, pro the project design team met again 
and agreed on the final solutions to be implemented. In general, the building was in good state, although there was one corner of the building that was damaged uh, due to salt contamination because of a nearby septic tank and the um, wooden construction around the balcony, the first floor was slightly damaged. As I mentioned before, the only two rooms that were heated originally in the building were the kitchen and the stube, both on the ground floor are both heated with open fire that are fed with the uh, log walls from the region. The aim of the retrofit, or what the owner wanted to achieve with the renovation of this building, was to bring the project, the building back to its best days and to find a solution that will improve the comfort of the occupants and reduce the energy consumption of the whole. That also meant a change of use in order to occupy the whole space of the building as a, find, as a way to finance the project and as a sustainable occupancy, occupation of the building, the owner decided to occupy the ground on first floor and rent the rest as a holiday apartments for visitors of the area. In the next section of the website, you can find all the people that were involved, all the stakeholders that were involved in the renovation of this project, from the architects, the conservation consultants, the energy consultants, as well as the Sotirole Bauenbund, the Association of Farmers of the Province of Bolzano, that had awarded a prize to this, to this project for being one of the best uh, farmhouse renovations in the region in the year 2016. In the next section of the website, we come to the specific retrofit solution, starting from the external walls, as uh, it was mentioned earlier by Walter Hudler, we find a building that has many different wall type constructions and all of them are listed here describing how the solution was compatible with the conservation of the building and how it had improved the final performance of the same. Starting from the ground floor in the parts where the walls were internally plastered, the uh, plaster was renovated with a thermal insulation plaster that can be applied directly on the wall and can follow the unevenness of any surface. On the section below, we can see the technical data of its solution. So starting from a U-value of 2.39 watts per square meter Kelvin, we, the U-value or the final thermal conductivity of the wall was reduced to 0 0.87. If we click on the more detailed section, we can see a sketch of the wall from the construction before that was made of plaster, a stone masonry wall and plaster to uh, retrofitted wall buildup in which the internal insulation plaster has been added. The same structure is followed for all the other wall types. From the stube, where the insulation is added in between the uh, stone masonry wall and internal wooden cladding, the substitution of the ground floor in the rear part of the building, and the insulation of the block bar, the solid wood construction with a wood fiber board panel applied to the inside. When it comes to the windows, the original wooden windows that were painted in a, a bright blue color were replicated with new units that were crafted by a local carpenter who find or who designed a modern window with a thermal glazing that can be re implemented in a frame that replicates the original, the original unit. Also the roof and the ground floor were insulated and the U-value of the thermal conductivity of these parts of the envelope were highly improved. In the case of the roof, from 2.7 watts per square meter Kelvin, the value was reduced to 0 0.2, and in the case of the ground floor, from 3.29, it was brought down to 0 0.28. Also, the heating and domestic hot water systems were replaced. In this case, the original heating system, as I explained before, was based on open fires that were fed directly with log walls, and now there is a combined system that uses both biomass and biogas, both produced uh, on site. The biomass is directly produced or directly brought from the uh, woodlands that is around the farm, whereas the biogas is uh, obtained from the manure of the cattle that is rare in this farm. Eventually, all the energy produced directly on site from the renewable energy sources is enough to cover all the energy demand from the main house, the Rheinhof, with the private uh, residence and all the holiday apartments, plus all the farming activities, plus a nearby house, and there's still some excessive energy produced. Eventually, the last part of, this, of the documentation of this project comes or brings us to the evaluation of the project. 
in this region in this part of the world the energy certification of our renovation is not compulsory however the design team together with the owners decided to follow an energy certification as a way to identify the potential for the renovation of this building as i said earlier the final energy consumption as it was calculated was brought down to 60 kilowatt hour per square meter per year that equals to a class c in the region of bolzano there is no unfortunately available data for the monitoring of the energy consumption what we do have is the results of the post occupancy evaluation that was performed by interviewing the owners and occupants of this building in general the feedback we received was extremely positive as the comfort indoor air quality and finally uh, final energy consumption was improved greatly and with this i would like to invite you to go to the website and visit all these details that are available to to all already thank you very much thank you very much daniel in theory, also for this case, we would have a video subtitled, but in order to allow for enough time for questions, we will just provide you with the YouTube link to it. With this, I give over to Bärbel for the question and answers. Yeah, thank you very much, Alexandra. I think I like very much the mix of um, letting uh, end customers of the renovated buildings speak and explain their motivation and their, um, well, better living after renovation. We have re received um, a lot of interesting questions and um, I think I will start with Alexandra with a bit of a general one. Um, Michael Fremov, he asked us whether um, the task uh, participants ever have done a more general assessment on the, the protection degrees of different countries. So what are the biggest differences in terms of finding conservation and uh, renovation approaches and um, the influence on architectural freedom in different countries this is probably a challenging one Alexandra but maybe you yeah, can I, talk I, from I, your experiences I think I would talk from my experiences so I have been working at this interface of technical solutions um, and conservation for about 20 years now and I would say yes of course there are differences between countries and i can tell you that each country is convinced they are the most severe ones but i think the difference are especially among the buildings and as soon as you can show that you understand the building and find the good solutions for the building i think um yeah ways open up <laughs> and of course you will not reach as so we call the task towards net zero energy because we think that the aim is to go with an ambitious target towards that how far we reach will depend on the single case so is it uh, there's another question which is a bit general um asking for you know the approach of of uh, um applying for um work to be done on a heritage building is can this be generalized how these uh, design decision processes with our state authorities work or what is what is recommended if you have such an approach in front of you what we see if we look at the documented cases and the brought in cases is that if you manage to get in a dialogue early um you have it more constructive <laughs> then okay. what is formally needed uh, that might vary from area to area but to kind of proactively look for the contact and involve is usually uh, a key to success okay good so um i have a question for pavel um one of our participants wants to know whether this tool is uh, possibly openly available that you introduced um hello um if it's open and so i didn't understand the, uh, the question if it's uh open. well if it can be used by uh, accessible by everybody yes it will be accessible but uh as we planned uh, the release by end of the project uh it's uh, april may 2021 maybe uh even earlier uh, uh via some beta version um it's it's it needs a little bit more time we are still as shown on the presentation in a stage of development 
and so-called working groups uh, on the different topics like this is such as solar and walls and windows building envelope uh, still documenting uh, the solutions so uh, please uh, follow our social media uh, probably the best way would be to uh, either on LinkedIn or Facebook uh, to search for project Atlas um, uh, just written as an uh, English word Atlas <laughs> Uh, uh, project Alpine, uh, sorry, Project uh, Interreg, and uh, you will be then informed about the release of this uh, uh, website. Okay, perfect. And Pavel, also for you, uh, somebody asked us, ask, is there the ultimate solution for building retrofit um, regarding the heating system? Retrofit? regarding heating system. Mm. I mean, the solution oh, for the heating wait. system in retrofitted historic buildings. Okay, I, 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 will, trans, I, will, I will define the question my way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so I will understand if there is the source of uh, so heating, so energy source and the way of transmitting the heat in the building, which is ultimately uh, universal to any building. Uh, of course not. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, there would not be so many. Um, <laughs> it, the, the, the source of energy uh, slash the, uh, the way of transmitting the heat into the heated space is highly dependent on the energy consumption, energy demand uh, of the building, of course. Um, so you can say that as better you insulate, as lower energy demand uh, we have, as more universal, uh, as more open so uh, options you have. Um, as example, so if you have a heritage building and you don't make any summer uh, improvements, it would be uh, very difficult to heat with a heat pump because then you would need a very, very high uh, heating area where you're going to in include this uh, thermal activation such as floor and uh, walls. But if the building is also thermally insulated, you would be able to use the uh, heat pump only by uh, temperating the floor, because for heat pump, you can't go high with the temperature of the surface, for example. But uh, it's a very exciting uh, uh, topic, heating of the space. Uh, as I said, it depends on the energy demand. And I'm pretty sure that when the tool is ready, that you will be able to, um, to find the best for you. Okay, perfect. Walter, some questions as a more practical person. Um, somebody is wondering how the challenge of uh, condensation in insulated walls, I suppose, which are internally insulated, can be avoided, you know. It's Kevin Oruk's question. Yeah, um, this is an um, important part. That we, we also discussed this, of course, in, in our group. Um, of the IEA task and um, and the general answer is to to do uh, the the building physics as good as possible and uh, really on a, on a on a detailed level. So this is the the only general answer you can you can give. So there is no specific solution. Uh, no general solution, no technical solution you can give for, for certain types of buildings. You have to inspect the building and do the building physics calculation for each building under the specific uh, climate okay. condition in every case. Okay. Um, another technical one, there was uh, one, uh, somebody stressing the fact that um, the U values, you know, the, the wall insulation values were not so ambitious in some of the case studies presented in the film. So how do you find compromises in terms of um, having low energy and um, having the heritage conservation needs of the building if you plan such uh, renovation processes? Yeah, that's a specific uh, challenge with historic buildings. In normal, normally you you try to improve the the building shell, let's say the wall, the windows, the roof as as much as possible in order to to cover the remaining demand with with uh, renewables. Um, in this case, uh, in the case of historic buildings, we we have to to take uh, compromises. Many of them are regarding the building shell 
let's say about um, Windows. Um, we have seen examples where it's possible to to replace the original Windows with um, new Windows um, at a, a normal or innovative uh, standard, but in, in other cases it depends very much on the monument protection uh, authority if um, a replacement of the windows is possible or if you have to keep the whole window in the original uh, version or you can keep parts of the windows. So um, these compromises depend very much um, from the, from the uh, on, on the building and on the requirements from the Monument Protection Authority, which is uh, in place. Okay, thank you. And um, another question uh, regarding costs. You know, Kevin asked you, do you have information about the cost of the renovation? That means energy versus uh, other measures, you know, in the final cases. Is this part of the Hyper Atlas or where is cost accessible? Uh, it is part, if you look at the evaluation section at the, at the bottom of each case study, you will find a specific section on costs where we um, have, you will find the information on the investment costs, but which is um, even more important information on the, on the running costs. Uh, particularly the, the energy costs. Um, unfortunately, this is data which is not available for all the case studies, but um, in some cases we also have life, life cycle cost uh, assessments for uh, the specific case study and uh, you would find this data if available also on the, on the website. Okay, perfect. Um, Tor, there is a, an interesting question from Col Moray from the Heritage Council in Ireland. He's asking you regarding this um, uh, norm that you presented and I will read out his question. Can the EN16883 approach be integrated with the iBoard energy renovation passport approach, which means accepting that the renovation process can be broken into several sequential sub projects for instance not just creating a short list of measures all to be completed at one time but also prioritize, prioritizing these and breaking them into packages that can occur at different times in sequence this has the advantage to reducing the risk of unintended interactions between multiple measures ensuring that user behavior in relation to energy usage leads to genuine energy reduction a long question, but I think a very interesting one. Can you give us your insights on that, Tor? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think in the field of renovation, there are already a number of, of guidelines, uh, national ones, international ones, uh, and the uh, guidelines I presented for historic buildings are really quite generic and, and would apply to most buildings. So I don't think it, it's a question of one or the other, or rather, as, as the um, question implies here, that you could somehow use them together. So uh, I think on, on the one hand, uh, you could uh, start with the iBroad Energy re Renovation Passport and, and, and look at the, uh, at the guidelines for historic buildings and see other sections that we could integrate to uh, focus on the aspects particular to historic buildings or vice versa. Uh, you could uh, use the, um, uh, the, Europe, the, the guidelines for historic buildings as your backbone uh, and then you could select the approach where you um, divide uh, a big project into uh, to smaller sub-projects, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot to do generally uh, in, in, in terms of, of realizing that um, uh, what we're talking about, energy, uh, improving energy performance in historic buildings is part of a bigger picture, which is renovation and, and general management of historic buildings. So uh, in short, my answer is yes, uh, I, I'd be happy to discuss this with the person who asked the question. Thank you. Good. 
Tor, uh, also a short uh, question for you, and then we are already more or less at the end of our time. Um, there is somebody asking about um, experiences if the building is already in a state of being very old, and he uses the word combustible due to ages past, and still starting a retrofit um, project. Do you have experiences with such kind of buildings in a very low state of performance? Yeah, um, we've uh, experienced a, a range of buildings from, from the ones that are in, in use in, and, and in quite good conditions to the ones as, uh, that could be described as, as combustible, even though that's a rather radical expression. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think it goes back to, to what I've said and what Walter says is you need to look at, at each building. So you could have a... Um, a building with very high uh, heritage values that's in a terrible condition physically and and there will be no doubt that you want to preserve it uh, so so you need to look at the overall picture and balance the the physical status with the heritage values and then make an initial decision based on that good i think altogether you were really encouraging to all planners and architects who have something um, worth conserving in front of them to, to um, work with uh, as well the authorities at an early stage and the users at an early stage and try to get different ways done for a good retrofit solution. Thank you very much to everybody. Thanks to the participants for their nice questions and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I pass over to uh, Arabella. Thank you very much, Babel, and thank you very much to all of our speakers and, of course, you, the audience, for joining us. And I think we have had many great presentations. The videos really made a difference and they had a really nice touch. And also, many of the questions, we received so many questions. So, thank you all for this lively webinar. Now, before we end the webinar for today, we here at ICE are very happy to share two more important events that are coming up for us in 2020. And we are very happy to invite all of you to join us at one of them, or maybe at both and I'm going to show them to you in a second. So the first one in September this year, we invite you to join us in Greece for the Eurosun 2020, which is the 13th International Conference on Solar Energy for Buildings and Industry. And I know that in past Eurosuns, we've seen case studies that were presented on historic renovations together with solar energy. So this is just the right place to come and look for solar in buildings. And the call for participation for this event will be issued next week, and we are very much looking forward to you joining us in Greece and presenting your work there. And then secondly, later this year in December, ISIS will be hosting a very special event in Australia, which is called the SWC 50, the Century of Solar. With this event, we will celebrate 50 years of ISIS Solar Work Congresses as the first ever ISIS Solar Work Congress was held back in Melbourne in 1970. This event will highlight the incredible success story of solar over the last 50 years, and we will look to the future where renewable energy will be the major cornerstone of the global energy system. The call for this special event is now open, and you can find more information online at swc50.org. And now for my final announcement for today, there will be, of course, a recording of the webinar, and it will be available both on the ISIS as well as the IEA SSC homepage in a few days. For our ISIS members, please remember that you have unlimited access to all past webinar recordings, as well as the presentations throughout the ISIS members area. Now, on behalf of ISIS, we thank all of you and of course our great set of speakers for your participation in today's webinar. We are always looking forward to your feedback. You can write to us at pathwayrelations at ISIS.org and there's a survey coming out to you and we very much invite you to complete it. So, thank you everybody again for joining us today. We very much hope you enjoyed the webinar. We will now end and we wish all of you a great day. Goodbye.